Hi, welcome to General Chemistry 2. My name is Chuck White and today's lesson is on phase equilibria. We're going to talk about the thermodynamics of phase transitions, melting, evaporation, and sublimation. We'll talk about the free energy of vaporization and how to calculate the equilibrium vapor pressure for almost any substance. And then we'll talk about phase diagrams. Now phase transitions are simply transitions between the thermodynamic phases of substances, solids, gases, and liquids, and the transitions between those states are melting, vaporization, and sublimation. Perhaps the least familiar of these is sublimation, but we all may be familiar with the fact that even on a cold day when there's snow on the ground, that snow can go directly from the solid phase to the gas phase without ever actually going through the liquid water phase, and that process is called sublimation. Now the melting point of ice um, we can calculate from thermodynamics using uh, by first writing the balanced reaction of solid uh, water going to liquid water and from thermodynamics table thermodynamic tables we can look up the delta H of fusion which is 6.01 kilojoules per mole and the delta S of fusion which is 22 joules per mole per Kelvin and what you should notice is that this is an endothermic reaction as written and entropy is also positive so both delta H and delta S are positive that means that enthalpy favors the reactants or ice and entropy favors the products uh, or or liquid water. Now um, at equilibrium uh, we have balanced these two opposing forces of enthalpy and entropy and we can solve this equation for the equilibrium temperature of uh, the phase transition uh, to be 273 kelvins which is 0 degrees Celsius or the normal uh, familiar melting point of ice. Similarly, we can calculate the boiling point of water. First, we write the balanced reaction between liquid water and gas phase water. Delta H of vaporization is 44 kilojoules per mole. This is endothermic, of course. And delta S of vaporization is 118.8 joules per mole per Kelvin. Again, entropy favors the products and enthalpy favors the reactants. We can um, set delta G zero equal to zero and solve for the boiling point and uh, that turns out to be 370.4 kelvins which is actually just a little bit less than 100 degrees Celsius and that just underscores the fact that this calculation is not exact because the values of delta H and delta S zero that we get from the thermodynamic tables are really for 298 kelvins whereas we've calculated a property of the system for 370 kelvins and so we have about a, um, let's see, what is that, 1% uh, uh, error uh, in the uh, calculation, which isn't bad. And that actually just underscores the fact that delta H and delta S aren't very dependent on temperature. But there's a little temperature dependence, and so we got a small error. Now we can actually use this, um, our knowledge of thermodynamics to calculate the equilibrium vapor pressure of any substance. We'll demonstrate this for water. And so again we write the balanced reaction of liquid water going to gas phase water and under standard conditions, that is to say 300 kelvins and one bar, the delta G zero for vaporization would be delta H minus T delta S which is 8360 joules per mole. When you look it up in a table you'd probably get 8.36 kilojoules per mole but it's important to convert to joules per mole. And uh, under equilibrium, under non-standard conditions, of course not one bar, uh, then we can write delta G of vaporization is equal to delta G zero of vaporization, which we looked up in the table, plus this correction factor for thermodynamic activities under non-standard conditions, RT log P. Now of course in the denominator there would be the activity for liquid water, but that's just unity and so we ignore it and, and it goes away. We can now rearrange this equation by setting delta G equal to zero and so P, the equilibrium vapor pressure of the liquid, is going to be equal to E to the minus delta G zero of vaporization, which we look up in the tables, divided by RT, uh, which at uh, 300 kelvins is 0 0.035 bars or 26.3 torr. 
Now, let's take a look at the phase diagram of water. These diagrams are normally presented as PT, or pressure temperature diagrams, and this one is definitely not to scale. It's exaggerated to make uh, some points. At most points on this graph, only one phase is possible. So in the white area, it would be solid ice, in the blue area, liquid water, and in the sort of uh, beige area, uh, gas phase, water vapor. And at low pressures and temperatures, we have a sublimation curve between the ice and the vapor. Near zero, we have a, an equilibrium curve between uh, the solid ice and liquid water that sort of goes up and to the left. And then from about zero degrees up to 374 degrees, we have a vaporization curve, which would be the equilibrium uh, pressure and temperature between water, liquid water and water vapor. Now, interestingly, that curve ends in something called the critical point, and above the critical point, above 374 Celsius, uh, we have uh, supercritical fluid, which is neither a liquid nor a gas, but just a fluid which is sort of uh, uh, in between those two things. The other important point on this diagram is the triple point, and that is the only point on this uh, diagram where you can have ice, liquid water, and water vapor in equilibrium with each other. That occurs at 0 0.01 Celsius and 0 0.006 atmospheres pressure. Now, J. Willard Gibbs said that for any pure substance, the number of independent thermodynamic degrees of freedom is F, which is equal to 3 minus P, where P is the number of phases present. And so we can look at this uh, PT uh, diagram, and we can say that if we have liquid, uh, then we can change the pressure and the temperature independently, and as long as we stay between the curves, uh, we have a 100% liquid sample. If we impose the condition that we want liquid in equilibrium with vapor, then we have to follow along this uh, vaporization curve. And if we change the temperature, then the curve tells us exactly what pressure we have to have uh, changed in order to maintain that uh, equilibrium. And so really there's only one degree of freedom uh, if we uh, demand that we stay on that equilibrium curve with two phases present. There's only one point on the diagram where we have all three phases present. That's the triple point, and we can't move in any direction in pressure or temperature. And so if we have three phases, then we have zero degrees of freedom. F is equal to zero in this case. Now, more generally, for a system of C, C components, if we had uh, liquid water and uh, liquid acetone mixed together, for example, uh, then the number of degrees of freedom would be 2 plus C, the number of chemical components, minus P, the number of phases present uh, in the system. Now let's take a little bit more detailed uh, look at the phase diagram for water. Uh, solids uh, can have many different crystal structures or polymorphs, whereas liquids can only have one and gases can only have one. And uh, the ordinary phase of ice is called ice 1H, which is a, which is a hexagonal uh, crystal structure, but there are at least 10 other known phases of solid uh, water. And some of the most unusual properties of water are really the result of strong hydrogen bonding between the molecules. The phase diagram for carbon dioxide is also a little bit unusual because the triple point lies higher than one atmosphere. So at one atmosphere pressure, where we usually uh, handle substances, uh, CO2 can be a uh, a solid below 78.5, minus 78.5 Celsius, or a gas above that temperature, dry ice exists at exactly minus 78.5 Celsius on, along that uh, sublimation curve, but the liquid really only exists above the triple point, uh, which is at 5.11 atmospheres, so you really have to pressurize CO2 to get the liquid at all. Uh, the liquid vapor curve uh, above uh, 5.11 atmosphere uh, kind of flattens out as it approaches the critical point, and that's the point where the delta H of vaporization goes to zero and the density of the liquid uh, becomes equal to the density of the gas. Supercritical CO2 is used as a solvent, for example, from extracting ca caffeine from coffee beans. So next time we'll look at solutions of solvents and solutes, we'll consider Raoul's law for ideal solutions, and we'll look at the colligative properties, freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, and osmotic pressure.